for the Gospel of Luke. It's a clear parable. The rich man and Lazarus. The rich man has no name, clearly showing that this rich man lived for wealth. That was just his identity. You know, it's the whole idea of born a man, died a doctor. <laughs> no longer am a man. I just live to be the special doctor who did medicine, and I wanted people to look up to me, and that's my identity. And so that's the discussion Jesus has in the Gospel of Luke when it comes to hell. Now, the rich man, fascinatingly enough, does not want his relatives to come to hell. And yet he wants to stay in hell despite talking about some of his misery. Now, that is very interesting. So you have to go to Scripture and parse out what is Jesus saying there when, when he's so clearly talking about hell and what it is. And again, I think it is. Have you ever talked to somebody who fully identifies with their career or with something that potentially could be good and that's all they identify with? I think when you worship something finite, it's going to turn you into either a depressed mania, manic person, or even an evil person who's so self-involved, it's scary. And so this rich man didn't want to give up that identity. He didn't want a God, and he didn't want to live outside of himself. So despite the misery, he wants to stay, but he would say, please go and tell my relatives. And what's the response to that? Your relatives have the prophets. Your relatives have all the evidence in the world. They're going to have to choose whether to follow Christ or not. That's the response, and that makes a lot of sense. I think he pairs the two perfectly when it comes to heaven and hell. When somebody says there is no truth, ask them, is that true? Right? Because a lot of people around here would say, there is no objective truth. Well, is that objectively true? You see the inconsistency? It's totally contradicting itself, right? A lot of people at UNC Chapel Hill, I haven't heard as much here, said to me, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Well, whose truth is it that's saying that? Is that your truth that's saying that, or is that my truth that's saying that? Do you see how it just totally contradicts itself? So your great question on, is Jesus the only way? It's an exclusive truth, and yet he was the most exclusive person on the face of the planet in history in welcoming everybody in the Roman Empire. Children, women, all races, people who had leprosy. That's inclusive, despite being exclusive in his truth of there only being one way to heaven. I appreciate yeah. your answer. Yeah. You, you can't go into someone else's world and, and see it from their perspective. Truth is ultimately subjective that way because you can't. Is that subjective? It any other way. Is that a subjective statement? Yeah. That I truth mean, is ultimately parents, subjective? You could say that it's a subjective statement, but that's because we're not God. Because That's because we're only human and we can only see from this, from these two eye holes. But you see the inconsistency in what you just said right there. Truth no, is ultimately I, subjective. Is that a subjective statement? That's just your own opinion. No, well, okay, well, maybe it's my own opinion, but we can all agree that we have never been in any other body. We can all agree that we've never seen any other perspective. That doesn't mean that perspective's objective. That means we only have this perspective. Yeah, well, I have seen other perspectives, and so have you. I've seen other people treat other people with racist attitudes. I've watched other people respect and love other people. And I make a judgment call, and guess what? I hope you do as well. I hope you say, when you have a racist attitude and treat that person in a negative way, that's wrong. And when you see someone who really lives a life of, it, of justice and integrity, you say, congratulations, sir, that's right. Okay, well, you could say that, but no, what about... could say that. But, but to what I do. But to those people, you're, you're percept but, but to those racist people, they think they're still in the right. Doesn't that prove that... Perception is subjective because they can think they're right. Well, of and course, you perceptive. Can think right. Perception is subjective. It's subjective, but that still doesn't change the fact that you're either right or wrong in your perception. And if your perception is that two plus two equals five, you are wrong, sir. And if your perception is that up is down and down is up, you are wrong. And if your perception is that I am a ghost, a bad dream you're having right now. Your perception is wrong. I'm not a ghost, I'm not, not a bad dream. You've chosen to stand there, I've chosen to stand here. And we are real. Now if my perception is, oh no, you're just a dream I'm having. Yeah, that's my perception, but my perception is wrong. Okay, so you- Perception does not define reality. Okay, so perce if perception does not define reality, then how can you justify faith? Very simple. 
The evidence is he's standing here. Is it possible that he's not standing here? Yes, it is. Anything's possible. So maybe he's not standing here. Right about now, I got to make a decision. What does the evidence point to? The evidence is he is standing here. My fist better stop here. And I better not just swing through his handsome face. Now, if my perception is, oh no, he's just a mirage. He's just a dream I'm having. I am out of touch with reality when I swing through his handsome face. You have gotta get in touch with reality. Truth exists. Two plus two does not equal three, it doesn't equal five. And he is here and my fist better stop here. Otherwise I'm doing travesty, wrong. You agree or disagree? I can't agree, but I also can say that I still think my point stands because I think that whenever you, uh, yes, there's evidence and yes, the reality of him standing there is there yeah. and it is our job as humans to use our perceptions to judge what we think is reality. Good. But it is also, those things are just, also could just be wrong because we're fallible humans. Yeah, that's right. We can right. also see that he's somewhere. If someone who is mentally, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say crazy, but let's just say crazy. Yeah. And they, they genuinely think that they're talking to a small little girl in front of them. Yeah. You can't convince them otherwise. So what? It's, well, that's that because- That doesn't change the fact that the girl is not there, even though the guy with a mental disease thinks he is, she is there. Okay, but you still are part of that still fallible mind. Yeah, At that's right. Point, so it's a faith decision. So, You're living by faith by saying that, right? Uh, how am I living by faith by saying that? Because, because, because it's your it's your perception. Your say, your statement right there is saying it's still perceiving. You have to trust. You have to make that ultimate leap to know that she's actually there. Okay, well that's only by our own objective reality. What like I said before, you can't insert yourself into someone else's body or to someone else's perspective. Know you're not it's fantastic what you're saying. That's a you are absolutely thing. correct. If there is no God. Because if there is no God, my rational mind comes from a highly developed monkey's mind. Would you trust the thoughts of a monkey? No, I do not trust the thoughts of a monkey. So why would I trust my thoughts if I believe that my mind is simply a highly developed monkey's mind? I am convinced, based on my experience and my logical thinking, that my mind, a rational mind, is not an accident. It doesn't come from the non-rational or the irrational. Instead, it comes from a rational creator who gave me the ability to think. And my ability to think enables me to get in touch with reality. And guess what? You cannot live out what you believe. You say you believe. You cannot live your life as if he's not here. I'm going to smack, keep, sm keep swinging. You cannot live your life as if that tree is not there. At the University of Florida, a guy said to me, my perception is that tree is not there. And I said, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to me because I have not yet watched you try and walk through that tree. You know very well that tree is there. So stop playing games with your mind and my mind. Okay, so yeah, the tree's there. The tree's there. Okay. Objectively, not subjectively, that tree is there. Okay. That's why you go around the tree, you don't try and go through the tree. Okay, if a tree All falls right. down in the middle of a forest and no one's around to see it, did it really fall, does it make a noise? You my gotta point be is, kidding is me. It, I, my point, is, my point is, is that your perception, ultimately, you will never be able to experience anything else. You will never be able to experience anything yeah. besides your own flawed perception. But so that is, your subjectivity is objective. No, you had better learn to critique your perception. Yes, that's I point. had better learn to analyze whether my faith in Christ is gibberish, stupidity, or whether he's the truth. And I can promise you, before you marry a woman, okay. you better determine whether she's trustworthy or not. Because if you marry a con artist and a liar and a cheater, you're going to be hurting pretty bad. Perception does not determine reality. You have rational minds. You better learn to use those rational minds to get in touch with reality. And if it says poison on it, you better respect that and not ingest it. Because you have a rational mind that can read the word poison. Don't drink it, please. It's going to be harmful. Okay. All right? Okay. Don't give me this gibberish that, oh no, it's all just your perception. You can't live that way, sir. That's an intellectual game you're playing. Don't play that game. It's hypocrisy. Why? Because you can't live it out. You wouldn't be a student here. Live this out. You, you, can, you, can, you can live out a reality set out by someone else, though. 
which is essentially what religion is. No, it's not. Jesus Christ was an historical person the same way he's an historical person. I'm not, I, I never way, denied that. I'm an historical person. I, I, I never denied that there was a Jesus of Nazareth. I never denied that. that How do you know that's not just some Jew's per perception? I, it's, to not, be consistent it's not that with it's someone's thinking. perception. I know it because several people wrote the Bible and now millions of people believe in the Bible. But it's so not what? necessarily. Maybe you're all deluded. Okay, I'm not saying that you're all deluded. I'm just saying that it, it's possible for perceptions to be wrong. And yeah. by that very argument, you can argue that your own perception is wrong. But don't you hear what you just said? It is possible that perception is wrong. Bravo. Okay. Don't give me the gibberish line that it's all just perception. No, it's not just all perception. Some of my perceptions are right. Other of my perceptions are wrong. Now, if I have a brain that works, I'm going to be trying figuring out which of my perceptions are right and which of my perceptions are wrong. And I better be humble enough to say I made a mistake. I'm wrong. It does make sense in good in a sort of way. I see your. I understand your point. Thank you. The the the, the thing that I disagree with because I don't believe that there is an almighty creator that, that made yes. my brain, and yep. because I don't believe that, yep. is that I believe more that my brain is just leftover processes, that my brain is not necessarily fine-tuned, but more good enough. My perceptions are not always the best. We as monkeys, as you put it, um, can look at our phone and run into that tree. We could, because we're preoccupied by the, yeah. the fat ass on our Instagram right. feed, right. we are, we, we run into the, we run into the tree. Yeah. And that's just, that's just monkey brain. And right. like, I don't believe that it's, you, you would create a mind that was perfectly rational that was still able to be captivated by the many addictions and basically other ways that psychology is exploited. I, I believe that the nature of psychology and the nature of our own limited perception right. is how a lot of our society profits off each other. Yeah. And because of that. And it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. It's horrible. It's pretty horrible. Yeah. Drug and guess what? You have a rational yeah. mind that has just critiqued our society yes. in a way that I think yes. is pretty perceptive. Of course. I mean, right? and, and yes. But we, it's we, not lying. It's, You've it's made not, an accurate analysis. Yeah, it, it's an accurate analysis. Yeah. But it, that doesn't necessarily, and we can all agree on that accurate analysis. But we could also get around 150 years ago and we could make the case that the white man is 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 superior to all the races. Yeah, that was we could done. we could make that sort of argument, and people agreed to that argument. Yes, and they used whatever justification they could find for that argument yes. because that's what a monkey does. Yeah, the monkey invents the story behind the reality, right. and the story, the story that it invents for itself, the perception that it invents for itself, I believe, is ultimately superior in importance than than what we think or than what we can all objectively agree. Because whenever we say that we all objectively agree on something, it doesn't necessarily go anywhere. Sir, something is not true because we all agree it's true. We can all be mistaken. A lot of Nazis, a lot of Nazis were really mistaken. All right? So truth is not determined by majority opinion. Truth exists separate. The challenge for me as a human being is to use my rational mind to get in touch with truth, to get in touch with reality. And Jesus Christ made the claim, I am the truth, come to me. Wow, the majority of those types of people we lock up in mental hospitals because they're crazy. Yeah. But when you look at the teachings of Christ, the ethical teachings, when you look at the way he developed friendships and related to people, when you watch the way he died, nailed to wooden crossbeam, instead of cursing his enemies, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But fourthly, when you see how he rose from the dead, guys, it's a no-brainer. He is the truth. The evidence points in that direction. Now, if you don't want me to follow Christ, because you don't think he's the truth, please give me a better option. If you want a better option, yeah. I'd say follow yourself, because that's the only thing you truly know exists. Oh, really? Well, let me tell you why I don't agree with you. Because this self does a lot of good at times, but this self at other times does a bunch of evil. Okay. Sin. Yeah. Sin. I'd be an idiot to put my faith in myself ultimately. But Jesus Christ, he never sinned. He lived a sinless life. In fact, he bled and died on a cross, forgiving the people I would have cursed. To their face, you idiots, nailing me to a wooden cross beam. But he didn't. He taught an incredibly high ethical standard, love your enemy, and then he lived it out. Man, that demands respect. And then he died and rose from the dead. 
Sir, you die and rise from the dead, I promise I'll listen very carefully to everything you have to say. I, I would hope you would. <laughs> Thank I would, you. I would hope. I would hope. Thank you. I mean, because that's, that's a pretty miraculous thing to happen. Exactly, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Stuart, what do you think? Well, it's problematic what you just said. When it comes to living for yourself, that's exactly what any good sociologist would say our culture is turning into, a culture of self-assertion. What do you get with a culture of self-assertion? You brought up psychology. When I was getting my master's in psychology, we talked about client-centered psychology and how it's all about just fixing you. Don't worry about your marriage. Don't worry about your children. Just focus on yourself. And that turns into an incredible type of, type of egoism. Of course. What does it lead to also? What are the ramifications? You all, if you go by that type of philosophy, will live by cancel culture. You'll live by a big one. Don't forgive other people completely. If, if they strike you once, do away with them completely because I'm living for myself. I'm not self-sacrificing. I'm living for a culture of self-assertion. That's why you can't live for yourself. Your self-assertion might be to live for other people. Your self-assertion. Humans, humans are naturally communalistic. <laughs> They're just grammatical. Us as tribes, we, we function together. Like one human cannot take down a tiger. Six humans can take down a tiger. We're naturally supposed to work together. Agreed. So I don't think that the nature of sin is within our fallible humanness. I believe it's in our success. I believe it's because there are seven billion people on this planet and anybody could feasibly do anything that they necessarily wanted. You think, no. Do you think the ramifications from an evolutionary standpoint, the strong eating the weak, do you think that fits in better with your emotional world and your lived experience? Does it make more s sense from a theological perspective of there's a ton of sin in there? Or from strictly a fatalistic, naturalistic perspective, which just says there's no injustice in that. It's just how the world works. What makes more sense? I will say that that one exists, but that's because we invented it to exist. We no, wrote it, it makes down sense in the most out of our experience. It's not. What no. is most experiential and evidential for you? That's how you form a world view. Well, of course, an experiential and ed evidential. And for when you, it comes I, to your tribe mentality, I totally agree. It typically does take six to probably six hundred people to take down these large animals, right? Yeah. So we work together. I agree that there's empathy. Psychology shows that we have yeah. a common type of empathy for each other. Here's where your train gets off the tracks, though. It, I believe if you're in one tribe, and here's another tribe, a rival tribe, if you have one person who says, I'm going to sacrifice for this tribe, ultimately that is selfish towards your own tribe and you should not do that. So when it comes to self-sacrifice, there's a total contradiction and breakdown in the evolutionary theory. It can be, it can be an aspect of that tribe's constitution to be self So for have, example. Wait, listen, like there can be secular people that believe in rehabilitation and forgiveness. Sure. That's just an aspect of your tribe. And Nietzsche, and Nietzsche would say you're just stealing from Christianity. Your prophet would say you're stealing from Christianity. It doesn't really matter, but like the, the because the psychology. You're for the humanities like, the point you said about it being psychologically untenable for the tribe to sacrifice for the other tribe is just void then. If, no, it just makes more sense a from a Christian worldview if you're going to sacrifice for somebody across the entire world who you don't know, who's of a different race than you, a different socioeconomic standing, a different gender, a different type of political you stance. Of you are going to human. sacrifice for them a type of altruism. I believe that slight altruism can fit into the evolutionary psychological theory. Yeah. But that form, that is so radical that you need a God and the human rights piece is such a leap of faith from simply a naturalistic perspective that the Christian worldview makes so much more sense. I disagree with the sense of it because I, I don't think religion injects morality into people. I, I, I don't think so. I think morality... No, I agree with that. I, 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 well, well, yeah, God, cre God creates morality. Okay, but like, my, my point is is that morality wasn't necessary. I, I, I don't... Okay. I don't agree to the sentiment that atheists don't have that or, or naturally fall to that strong, eat the weak worldview. No, neither do I. Okay, so why are there only two options? Dostoevsky talked about if you remove God, everything is permissible. Atheists hate when Dostoevsky said that because they thought, oh, you're, you're calling me immoral. You're saying every atheist is immoral and hates people. That wasn't his argument. His argument was if you remove God, moral obligation and accountability now everything is permissible. I can do whatever I want. 
right? So if you think God is the definer of right and wrong, and you think Christ is uh, God in human form, in Jewish theology, we, we believe in God. We believe in God's teachings. We believe what he says, but we don't believe in Christ. And in Jewish teachings, the woman's life matters more than the unborn child. So what makes abortion wrong? Okay, I agree. If the mother's life is in danger, and the doctor says to the husband, do you want me to get the baby out of this delivery room safely, or do you want me to get your wife out of the delivery room safely? Why does he have to say it to the husband? Why can't he say it to the wife? He can say it to the wife. He can say okay. it to anybody he wants to, okay, or she wants to. Okay? We got that straight? Yes. Good. Okay. I would support whoever's making the decision when they say, doctor, you get my wife, you get my daughter, you get this woman, my friend, out of this delivery room. And if you lose the child in the process, you lose the child. So then my question is, you might not even know the answer, but why are we making laws about women's bodies when Christianity, most likely Catholic, or most prevalently Catholicism, why, why is that the basis of all of our laws? Okay. I am gonna support a law against racism in renting houses and apartments. I'm going to support a law for equal housing opportunity. Why? Because that's morally No, 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 let me answer the question. The reason that I am is because I'm convinced he's a human being, created in the image of God, therefore racism is wrong. I am going to support that law. That is not me foisting my religion on society. That is me taking what I believe is ethically right and supporting a law that says, if you discriminate against him. But racism has nothing to do with the conversation. That we're yes, having. it has everything to do with the conversation. Similarly, if someone tells me this life is less valuable than this life, I'm going to say you're wrong. Because I am convinced we are both creating the image of God, we both have equal value. So, six to eight weeks after conception, he's got brain activity, he's got heartbeat. Don't touch him. Don't suck his life apart. He's a human being, at least by six to eight weeks. What about before six to eight weeks, when he doesn't have necessarily heartbeat and brain activity? From my perspective, my thinking, there is no difference between a one minute old fertilized egg and a 22 year old fertilized egg. You just said from my thinking. Yeah, I'm giving you my thinking. Okay. Okay? Therefore, I am opposed to abortion because I am convinced it's ending a human life. I now, if it's not a human life, no problem. I cut my fingernails, I peel my calluses, nothing wrong with that. And if a one minute old fertilized egg is just excess skin, cut it out. But why does your no thinking, problem. Why does your thinking constitute the laws for all of these people? That's why I started where I did. That you told me I was avoiding your question. I, I started never with you. Were you. Yes, you that. did. I started with equal housing opportunity. Well, that's a red herring. Pardon? It's a red herring. Yeah, it's, it's not a red herring. It's laying the foundation. I was laying the foundation to How show you. How does discriminatory, discriminatory housing deal with like abortion? It's legislating morality. When I support a law against discrimination, I am legislating my morality. So are you. So are we all. Yes. And I'm pointing out that we all legislate morality. The hard question is, what morality are we going to legislate? I didn't ask why you seek to legislate against it. I said, why is that what constitutes it? Why is Catholicism and Christianity what constitutes our laws? It's not. It's not. Catholicism does not determine the laws in the United States. Christianity so, does so not determine the laws So what do you call these anti-abortion laws, laws? We vote. We're in a democracy. We vote. Who's it's not the Catholic Church that determines morality in the United States and votes? laws. It's the government. Me, do you want me to pull up a chart of who votes? Because I can guarantee you it's rich, white, uh, privileged men. And you know why? It's because they're taking our education, they're taking our voting education out of the, out of the school systems. Do you know what who the, here learned about voting in high school? 
That's not a lot of people. Every one of us, when we vote, we are voting for people who stand for particular laws. We all legislate morality. Second point, the obviously the difficult question is, which morality do you want to see legislated? And that's where we disagree, right? Okay, but wait a second, just a second, let's finish this. Thank you. So, because I view him as a human being, if you don't want to rent your house or apartment to him because of his ethnic heritage, I am going to support legislating morality that says you must rent your house to him. Similarly, because I believe that he was a human being before he passed down his mother's birth canal, I'm going to tell you I'm going to legislate to protect him before he passes down his mother's birth canal because I'm convinced he's a human being created in the image of God. Now. That's why I, I do what I do. Does All that right. make sense? I understand. This was a caucus race. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you for and your have time. A great day. You too. You have a great evening. So, why should we be beholden to the fickle whims of a God who can change his mind at any moment? He could send down a flood to kill all of us for being... Yeah, there's many punishment. examples of his punishment, especially in the Old Testament. That was part of the Old Covenant. The New Covenant, you see him tightening the noose through Matthew chapter 19, where, for example, it was allowable to give a woman a certificate of divorce in the Old Testament, and that was the way it was, where it was broader. It was broader with a nasty, brutish, ancient Near Eastern culture that was slowly progressive. There's a lot of progressives here on this college campus, by the way, that's a Christian term. It came out of Christian theology. This is not a capricious God. He is consistent in the Old Testament to judge unruly people groups with some, despite all their despicable ways, the Amalekites, he gives 400 years to turn and change. That is grace before he punishes. Then in the New Testament, you see grace coming into play where Jesus comes, the light to the Gentiles we have in the Old Testament, which it was through a Jewish people, but it was not ethnocentrism. It was not all, let's just celebrate the Jews. No, but Jews were the chosen people to be a light to the Gentiles. And then you see Jesus Christ fulfilling the new covenant, dying on the cross for a broken world, for all people to welcome all people into eternal life. So it's an exclusive truth. It has to be through Jesus, but it's the most inclusive truth imaginable because it's offered to all human beings. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.